I mean, given the, the amount of predictive products, doesn't it seem like there would be, he has some expectation that you just have the products memorized? I'm not sure what you meant by that. So given that this, uh -huh. you know, this exam with uh, 20, uh, let's see, how many, how many other questions? 11 mm -hmm. questions predict the product. Would that seem that he feels that you have some of them memorized? I mean, given an hour and 40 minutes to take a test? I'm not sure what you mean by memorized. Just the products memorized. I don't quite, but what do you mean From by the book, uh -huh. just memorizing the product, not necessarily knowing the mechanism. Oh. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, I guess I would disagree with that. He, uh, he expects that you have the mechanism memorized mm -hmm. so that you can get to so you can get to the product quickly. Okay. Um, after all, um, it doesn't. If you really have the mechanism memorized, it doesn't take that much extra time to draw that mechanism. Okay. There's no way you can have the products memorized because there's billions of different reactions sure. he can give you. So yeah, um, organic chemistry teachers want people to focus on uh, knowing the mechanisms. The analogy I like to use is. You need to know the mechanisms as well as a chess player knows how the bishop moves, or how the rook moves, or how the pawn moves. Um, so a, a chess player would not congratulate themselves if they can figure out how the bishop moves after 30 seconds. Sure. They have to just look at the bishop right. and know automatically. What's well, the same deal here? We have to be able to look at the reagents and know automatically what the right react, what the right mechanism is. And then that's so. So the answer to your question is how your, your question was how can you possibly be expected to get all these questions right in the time available? Well, like some yeah. of them that don't even have. The don't have the reagent list. They have just by name. Oh, well, you certainly are expected to have memorized some of the reagents. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Now, th there are some reactions where you're not expected to know the mechanisms, but these reactions we're going through here, the mechanisms already right. worked. Okay. And the key is just to have them so internalized that it uh, they come to us as automatically as knowing how the pieces move in okay. chess. Now, in the time that's remaining between now and the exam, I'm sure you probably won't have time to get that level of mastery of all the reactions, but whatever study time you spend, that's kind of how you want to spend it, mastering as many reactions as right. possible. Well, let's try to predict the products here. Tell me, what, what do those, do you know what that represents when that they use groups like that? That's right. Okay. The convention is that if they don't tell you it's at the end of a line, it's just like we would assume this is a methyl group, we would assume these are methyl groups. Okay, that's right. Two. Okay, how did you figure that out? Um, well, we have a weak base, Good. more of a, a second degree carbon. Great, so let's point to which cell we're in. Yeah, there you go. All right, so that's SN2. That's right. Good. It's good that you recognize that this is an ionic bond and the sulfur really has a negative charge. Well, looking at our table, we're in the column with negative sulfur and we're in the row for secondaries and that predicts an SN2. Okay. Now let's think about the stereochemistry. Do SN2 reactions generally give you one product or two products when we're at it? Uh, one yeah. product. Yeah, one product. Yeah, we have to take the inversion. So how do you determine it when it has just, do you, you just, or is it, it's gonna, it's gonna be, uh, I'm sorry, it's gonna be uh, equatorial. You can go now, good. You figure that out, that's right. 
Normally, when we're showing stereochemistry, we use wedges and dashes, but that's not the conventional way to show substituents on a chair cyclohexane. When we're drawing chair cyclohexane, we don't show stereochemistry with wedges and dashes. We do it with uh, axial and equatorial. Well, if we're going to invert the stereochemistry here, the sulfur should not end up axial, because that's where the leaving group was. Instead, like you have it drawn now, it should end up equatorial. So this would give us this product here. So he's testing two things here. Partly he's testing getting the right mechanism, but then they're also testing getting the right stereochemistry. We always have to watch out for that. This is a rare case. Even though this is not a stereocenter, we still have to get the right stereochemistry because we have to show whether this is going to end up cis or trans to this substituent over here. Uh, so we do need to show this is going to be equatorial. There still is some stereochemistry here. All right. Well, the theme of this whole little set of problems here is that at least in these problems, the instructor was really giving you a workout on knowing when to do SN1 and SN2 and E2. Uh, he gave three, four problems in a row about that. So um, there might not be as much about that on your, on your final, but still I would expect there would be problems about that, and knowing this table is the way to go.